In uh, my work, I get to travel around a lot. I've, I've, Robin Gibson and others have heard me say, I think I have the best job I could, anyone could possibly have because what I get to do is, is um, travel around and help communities figure out what they want to be when they grow up, basically. Uh, and even the old ones are always changing. And so um, one of the thrills uh, for our firm and, and in my work, for all time, but especially in the last few years, was getting to work on the plan for revitalization in downtown Lake Wales and uh, in the Northwest neighborhood. And along the way in uh, falling in love all over again with Lake Wales, we began to realize just how big the footprint of people like William Lyman Phillips, who worked in the Olmsted Brothers firm, uh, Olmsted Jr. himself, and even uh, indirectly, I think uh, Olmsted Senior on this environment has been. Uh, living in South Florida, I knew William Lyman Phillips as the great legacy master landscape architect who designed places like Matheson Hammock uh, Park, which is one of our signature legacy parks along Biscayne Bay, and Fairchild Tropical Garden, and so forth. And I had no idea, actually, at the time that prior to all that work um, post New Deal in the Southern part of South Florida, Phillips was here and representing the Olmsted Brothers firm of uh, supervising work for Lake Wales, more of it city planning, less of it landscape architecture, and also following up on the work that the firm had done for Bach Tower and Mountain Lake in previous decades. And, uh, as, as designers are always uh, want to do, we started trying to draw a line between what they were finding, what they were thinking, and what we were doing. Uh, you know, you look for one, just hoping that there's justification for the things you know would be best practice uh, in history. But you didn't have to look very hard at all. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a, sort of a running joke among architects and landscape architects is that they, they start with the ancient Greeks and Egyptians and Romans and then draw some sort of line through history to culminate in their work. And we, we realized that that would be a little egotistical and arrogant of us to think that. What we realized is that a lot of the work that was needed here had already been done. It was on paper or it had been described in, in words. Uh, in uh, the case of the 1930 or so, 1929 through 1931 planning work by the Olmsted brothers, 136 single spaced typewritten pages uh, they had described what was needed here. It was very interesting. And we learned that they had uh, very down to earth practical ideas, do this to save money, do that to solve a utilitarian problem. Uh, but they also had lofty aspirational ideas, you know, how to make a place that would showcase new and better ways of living in this garden of Eden. The idea that you could, in this unique landscape on the ridge, emerge with a city that seemed to rise out of the garden uh, was as big as the idea of the tower rising off the top of Iron Mountain. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll try to draw some comparisons um, between uh, what they were doing and how they were thinking and what we have learned uh, from them to try to do now. And then I'll look forward to your questions. The first big topic is uh, what I call before and after thinking. Uh, Olmsted Senior would look at a landscape and he was influenced, you probably know his history, but he was influenced by all sorts of early careers uh, prior to becoming a landscape architect in midlife. He didn't actually devote himself to landscape architecture as a practice or call it that until he was in his mid, in his mid 40s. And so prior to that, he had been a, a, a correspondent, a journalist, you, you know, showcasing or, or chronicling uh, racial injustice in the Deep South prior to the Civil War. Um, he had been involved in a great many different uh, jobs, some of them in government, some of them private, eventually found himself uh, a landscape architect, or as we like to think of him now, <coughs> the father of modern landscape architecture in the United States. Olmsted would look at one of those landscapes and squint and visualize, visualize changing it how it would be before and after. And so if a great example, of course, uh, in New York, there's Central Park and there's Prospect Park in Brooklyn. Arguably, Prospect Park is 
closer to his vision and more masterfully uh, implemented than Central Park, which was be uh, begun uh, before he got there. But in Prospect Park, they did a lot of manipulation of the existing conditions before and after to result in the beautiful effects that are there. Um, so one of the things that they did was try to heighten the impressions you get from nature as you found it. So they would mound up the hilltop a little higher and increase the contrast between the foreground, the middle ground, and the background, much like a painter would on a canvas. And they, this squinting and visualizing and then drawing the change as you wish it to be. Sometimes doing something that looked naturalistic. Um, many folks visit Prospect Park or the, or the central, central parts of Central Park in New York and, and think, well, this is just the way wild nature looked in Brooklyn or in Manhattan. It actually isn't that at all. It's set design. It's very much a result of Olmstead and steam shovels and crews of people piling up the earth in ways of different digging ponds and lagoons where they did not prior, have previously exist before and after. Now, there's, there's something you need to know about this that relates directly to Lake Wales Connected. Um, Olmsted Sr. didn't come up with that way of thinking, of course. Everyone who did, ever designed anything applies before and after thinking. But uh, he traveled early in his uh, career to England and he studied the landscape works of Humphrey Repton. And Humphrey Repton is really the father of before and after because he always presented his garden designs uh, via paintings. And they were in perspective, not just plans like the technical drawings that are used in architecture, landscape architecture and engineering. Those top down map views were always complemented by these gorgeous eye level landscape paintings. And the difference in his, between his paintings and those of many masters who were um, using the same technique was that he would do two paintings before and after, sometimes taking the canvas and cutting it out from the after and taping it over the top of the original. And then he would stand in his clients and lift the flap and say, before, after, before, <laughs> after. And so here's one of those examples. Now, landscape architects like Repton were mainly working on private pleasure grounds, you know, the private gardens of aristocrats and so on. Uh, and very little of their work can be found in public park spaces. But Olmsted saw this and saw this technique and said, we can do this for the benefit of everyone in what would be the new common grounds that he saw as a way to improve public health and society. And so the before and after pictures of Repton, you can see pairs here before and after, uh, are sometimes about landscape. Sometimes they're about restoration. Sometimes they're about architecture. And uh, we tried to bring this same technique to Lake Wales Connected. If you flip through the pages of it, you'll see that um, like Olmsted, we were trying to squint at the existing conditions and imagine what could be there if a few interventions fell into place, however long that might take or however expensive that might be. In our own practice, we do a lot of before and after thinking. I always show this pair just to <laughs> dramatize it. A lot of the landscapes we have are not like those beautiful pleasure grounds Repton was painting. A lot of the landscapes we have are the tired uh, landscapes of, of suburbia aging none too gracefully. Uh, but I promise that is uh, not the Eagle Ridge Mall. <laughs> but it might as well be because we have thousands of those all over the country. But so in what we're trying to do these days, um, in Lake Wales and other places, is visualize how one might take these inherited spaces and recycle them, reimagine them. And as they are gradually rebuilt, try to create something that would have a little more economic resilience, staying power, more reasons for being, and might engender a little more loyalty than we feel toward the old dead Kmart or the old dead Sears or the old dead Circuit City or the, uh, don't need to keep going through the list. <laughs> you all know how that goes. So in uh, part of before and after thinking that we learned from Repton is also to start with the green parts. So in these examples I'm showing you, sometimes they're draw hand drawings and sometimes like, uh, reference paintings, sometimes they're computer images, but what we are attempting to do is visualize the public space first, starting with the green parts, and then uh, visualize how the hard architecture bits, the real estate development, 
can be used to shape that, frame that, and be its backdrop, as opposed to the other way around. A lot, a lot of what we don't like about the world of the inherited landscapes is that they started with the automobile, accommodated it first, then added a little extra asphalt, and then added a little more asphalt just in case. And then they jammed in all the real estate necessary, max, maxing out the land development regulations. And then at the end, if there was anything left, as you can see on the foreground, on the bottom on the, light, on the left side, add in a little landscape. And what we've been saying is it works a lot better if you start with the green parts, you visualize how uh, the public space will, and that public space includes parks and squares and plazas and trails and greenways. It also includes green tree-lined streets. Um, so it, it occurs to me that that is actually what Lake Wales is going through right now, rediscovering how to start with the green parts and apply before and after thinking. Now, there is so much here. And part of it is the result of the Olmsted brothers' work. Part of it is a result of the good, year, good work that took place over the 50-year period prior to them. Uh, but there's so much here that represents the good bones for city making. Uh, you know, streets that feel like streets and civic buildings that are worthy of being kept. And so in Lake Wales Connected, we try to do before and after thinking. This is one of the panels in that work to illustrate how Lincoln Avenue can be transformed. And, it's always interesting to see what we can do with minimal intervention. Most of what you see in this picture is not new architecture. Most of it is improvement to the landscape and adjustment to the street design, to the spaces between buildings. So if we start with the green parts, we'll end up with good addresses where people like to build their architecture and face it with the storefronts and balconies and doors and windows of their architecture. Uh, but the reason they're good addresses is because of that tree-lined street and or because of that square or public space or verdant park that makes its boundary. There were a few key ideas in Olmsted Senior's work that he trained his successors to follow. And they're very much in evidence uh, in the work of the Olmsted Brothers firm and even their successors, uh, people like William Lyman Phillips or uh, John Nolan who designed a lot of things in Florida after training under Frederick Olmsted, Olmsted Jr. But these are the key things. The first is the one that was the most important. It's really the reason to do city planning. It's the reason Lake Wales Connected is important. It says all these little individual decisions add up to something greater, but you have to start with the idea of the big picture. What is this town trying to be when it grows up? And then fit the small pieces into effect. Uh, you, the whole is more important than the parts. I almost also had this idea that there's a lot of stress and uh, discomfort and uh, a maladjustment that comes from modern life, from the stresses and the bustle and the schedule and the noise and the machines and the artificiality of it. And so he had this idea that scenery, a term he used a lot, uh, in parks and public spaces would help us restore ourselves. This was around the time when public health was becoming a subject. And from the discussion about how to improve public health in the toxic, noxious industrial city of the 19th century, landscape architects were sort of leading the way by saying, we can improve public health if we make the city more healthful by greening it, by giving people the green places where they can get a breath of fresh air, by creating spaces where the stormwater can roll naturally across landscapes and cleanse on its way through the water bodies. Uh, and so this idea of scenery heals applies to us in our souls uh, and in our physical bodies, but also applies to the ecology around us. Now, he also had this idea that you, you don't decorate. This is one of the reasons why I didn't like the term gardening very much. Have you heard that about Olmsted? Olmsted Sr. didn't like the word gardening. He thought it was way too superficial and, and simplistic. It sounded like planting flowers. Um, and, and that's why I think it became fond of the term landscape architecture. It sounds a little more serious, doesn't it? Um, but the idea that you do things for functional reasons and then from that grows the beauty of the, of the place, not by adding stuff to it. And then uh, the last one is this one I was describing in the before and after thinking, composition. The idea that you're arranging things in the scene, just like a set designer might arrange things under the proscenium arch in the theater, 
where a filmmaker, cinematographer will arrange elements within the frame uh, or a painter on a canvas. Olmsted and his son and their successors were concentrating things, exaggerating the juxtapositions, for example, of, of going wide before going narrow and then going narrow before going wide again in a space or low before high or dark before light to, in order to exaggerate the effects of these places because they felt that would, that would also intensify its restorative power. The public health conversation led to a word we hardly ever hear anymore, but they used a lot, decreation. They thought that being surrounded by machines and working on schedules and uh, being stressed was uh, damaging to the human psyche and soul. And so the term we use all the time these days, recreation, they pronounced recreation. It was the antidote to decreation. So the idea of a children's play park, for example, was a healing space in their minds. Um, that was the connection between progressive thinking in their time and uh, the landscape makers. So if you look at, at the bigger picture things like Olmsted's designs for uh, the Emerald Necklace in Boston, you, if you think about it through those lenses, you don't see just a collection of interesting parks and skinnier parks or greenways that connect them. You see an idea of the city as a whole organism. And I think this is where they, as public health advocates, public space advocates and advocates for beauty, they became the first city planners as we know them. In fact, John Nolan, who trained under Olmsted Jr. at Harvard, uh, was the first American to call himself a professional city planner. Even Olmsted Jr., who was the first president of the American City Planning Institute, didn't call himself that. He called himself a landscape architect who performed city planning services. But Nolan said, uh, it's bigger than that. We're, you know, the, the plan of the city is the thing. And then from there, we, z we zoom in and work on the individual parts, like the individual park or the individual greenway or the individual street or building. And that holistic way of thinking seems to me kind of captured by what the Olmsted brothers had already done in Lake Wales before they got to work on the city. Because in designing Mountain Lake and in designing the garden around us here, uh, they were attempting to create a slice of heaven, perhaps a, a place that felt whole in all its parts. It wasn't just decorated with flowering plants, but rather spaces were made that spoke to us. And then when asked to, um, to talk about it, uh, Olmsted Jr. Uh, identified Iron Mountain as the best place to start. <laughs> Said other, other places have good land, they have good citrus, they have good climate, they have good health, though none have better. And, and nowhere else are there any outlooks like the one from the top of Iron Mountain. And then at the very end of that phrase, he says, develop the landscape beauty of a tract to its fullest extent in connection with its economic development. Well, well economic development, exactly. This was six years after Daniel Burnham had said, um, no one ever created a commodity more valuable than beauty, and no one ever will. If we want to make a place economically vibrant, we have to make it a place where people want to be, and that means beauty is not extra. It's not ornament that we can add on at the end, but rather something that has to be integrated in it from the beginning. And that you could already see in Lake Wales, in early architecture, for example, this kind of commitment. So at the point when the streets were barely paved, uh, in the downtown. And in fact, when the, uh, the modest homes next to the railroad tracks were, um, were built at the, at the very, very basic minimum of simplicity and cost, they still had a porch, They're still sociable. It's still kind of beautiful if you think about it. And then the parks. It, it wasn't lost on Olmsted Jr. that they that the city was blessed with an incredible generosity and just the sheer amount of public space. And so they set to work on making the public spaces better. Um, this is not an Olmsted drawing, it's done by one of their peers, but in the design for how to enhance the parks, uh, Lake Wales Park and Crystal Lake Park in particular, there was this, this idea that you can't afford not to do this. 
because you've inherited this great acreage, now you need to make these spaces all they should really be. And from that came this concept for a city and a garden. Um, now, the, the, um, the plan that Olmsted Brothers initially did, although they added to it later, um, in the first years uh, was 136 pages, as I said. They charged the modern day equivalent of about $75,000. I think that was a real bargain. Uh, for the community to do that. It's very light on drawings. There, there are a few pages of maps, things like this. There are some better reproductions. It's actually long on text, and it's worth looking at if you're interested in this. But I thought it was interesting, in light of what I said a minute ago about beauty, that uh, there are five pages devoted to the importance of the appearance of the city. That's, uh, you know, and, and ways to get a better appearance. And some of it talks about how to screen ugliness lists off the things in their day they thought were ugly and then how to how to screen them and uh, it lists off ways to make the city more beautiful from the beginning it cautions that street trees are so crucially important it spends a page or two on that and then says but it's not just street trees <laughs> and then lists a bunch of things in addition to that but i think that's very interesting to um these days uh that number of pages on beauty alone will uh, get us written up uh, at the Chamber of Commerce meeting for wasting taxpayer dollars on <laughs> such things. But remember the utility was there as well. There are a few drawings uh, that are companions to that work. One is the, the plan for Druid Hills, which is a um, neighborhood uh, just north of 60 and in the southeast of Lake Wales Park, uh, where you can see the Olmsted Brothers uh, signature patterns. The streets connect in a web it's more like a web and less like a tree, but they don't connect in a harsh or regular grid iron. They're picturesque and curving and adapting to the topography, um, revealing something as you go around the corners. Now, I wasn't aware how extensive this work is until I was alerted to the uh, graduate student work of Alexis Winters, or now Alexis Winters Wareham, um, who grew up in Lake Wales and went to the University of Florida. And about 20 years ago, she devoted her senior year to gathering all these maps, actually scanning all the individual old maps and putting them together for the first time in, in one map, and then analyzing the written descriptions and call outs for which uh, species of trees should go where according to the Olmsted brothers. And uh, I met with Alexis when we first started Lake Wales Connected and it's a huge debt uh, to the Lake Wales Connected work that she had done this research and made us aware of it. Uh, the Olmsted brothers were a little apologetic about prescribing palm trees where they did. They said, for example, that, well, we know that there's not shade and that there's such an effect from palm trees. So we should do some of that, just not only that. Um, that was an interesting finding from that work. Um, so we gathered her drawings and assembled a two page spread in Lake Wales Connected uh, in the report uh, with the Olmsted map. And it's in the first few pages of the Lake Wales Connected uh, master plan. And I hope that says something about how important we think this foundation is. So let's, let me just give you a quick uh, walk through what's in the Lake Wales Connected plan. Then I'll talk about how it's being implemented and, uh, and add some final admonitions after that. Uh, like I was just saying, the, right in the front of the book, there's this uh, recap of the story of the city's history and the Olmsted uh, uh, legacy. And, um, and some photographs of the uh, historic photographs of the way things were, including a little clock tower, which is a work product of the Olmsted Brothers firm, uh, originally next to the railroad tracks, then moved down Park Avenue to where we know it now at Market Square. To make the plan, we had uh, we applied uh, an approach we call design in public. I said to uh, Deputy Mayor Gibson and the other leaders at the time, we advocate as open and public and transparent a process as you can possibly stand. <laughs> um, and uh, I think the people took us up on that offer. There was a wonderful initial burst of walking and photographing and measuring and looking and then we we gathered in big rooms like over at the community center and in small groups around maps marking them up what 
asking local folks to describe to us what they like, what they dislike about the way they, they find the city now, what their hopes and dreams and ambitions and fears are. And uh, over the process of a very busy week, uh, the whole week of design, we, tr we took these many ideas and attempted to braid them into one strong rope. I'll just give you one uh, window into what we were learning. One of the exercises we undertook was to give everybody a little card. And we asked the folks who came to the meeting to write on that card one word that comes to mind about the core of Lake Wales. That's the downtown and the Northwest neighborhood uh, today, now. Uh, and they said things like, it's disconnected. And you know how these word clouds work, the bigger, bolder words are the things people said more often. Uh, it's disconnected. Um, it's historical. It's underdeveloped. I mean, there's lost space and there's room. Uh, there's potential for growth. Uh, we could fill in the lost space, I think is what that underdeveloped means. Um, you know what they say about Brazil, right? There's an old saying, it's really mean. I'm sure the Brazilians don't like hearing it, uh, that Brazil has a lot of potential and it always will. So you don't really want to say we have potential because that means you're just banking it and you're not acting on it and putting it to work for the benefit of your citizens, right? So underdeveloped was a red flag. It says that means we could accommodate growth and change and economic progress in the city we've already got without having to spread out across into the hinterlands and decant the economic power of the city onto the raw green spaces around us um, if we'll simply do it. So that's important. Segregated, another word came to mind. And then we, of course, we asked them to turn the paper over and give us one word that described Lake Wales tomorrow, you know, in the future, in their vision. And they replaced words like disconnected with vibrant. Historic is still there. Disconnected becomes connected. Uh, underdeveloped and boring becomes diverse and alive. So what that told us, that one little one word conversation is that at least among the people who were volunteering time to walk in our storefront or, or uh, come to one of our meetings, the, uh, people that were taking a minute to come look at the map, that there was optimism, that change could make things better rather than worse. Now let's think about that. Americans. Let me change that. Floridians <laughs> are conditioned to believe that change and growth will make things worse rather than better. We are suspicious of growth and change. Um, the running joke among our developer friends is that's why everybody in phase one turns out to oppose phase four's zoning, right? <laughs> we are hardwired in a way to, or at least conditioned to believe that growth and change makes things worse because of the built evidence all around us. And you can take a ride up and down 27 or 60, and you can see what I mean. So that lack of confidence in the idea that growth and change can make things better is our number one problem. If we're to turn the lights back on in downtown Lake Wales and its environs and still love it when, the pro when progress has come and economic uh, improvement has taken place, we have to restore the confidence in growth and change. And so I think that really the, the conversations that were unfolding as we were walking around, it, uh, what we were learning from looking at historic pictures all come back to that same point. All the historic buildings were built with that kind of early 20th century optimism that growth and change would make things better. The developers weren't called developers, they were called neighborhood founders. That's significant. Um, but if you look at uh, the 1970s, on a street like Stewart Avenue, um, you discover that it was once a much busier economic part of town. This picture was actually made in the early 70s. You can see a pile of bricks over on the left when the streetscape work was being done on Stewart Avenue. But at the time, uh, the main streets like Stewart and Park Avenue were still where the businesses were, where the action is. I saw that picture and I walked out of our ad hoc on location design studio 5 p.m. And I took my camera and I set up carefully and waited you know, to catch a pedestrian coming across <laughs> in the frame. And I just kept waiting and kept waiting and no one came. 
And it was clear that we had this great and, and important historical city with all its basic attributes, right? But something had happened to, uh, to lose all the people, to scare all the people away. I, so I walked over onto Park Avenue and I said, it's gotta be Stewart's problem. I'll go onto Park Avenue and I set my camera up and I waited. And again, no pedestrians. And we're talking about rush hour. So it was apparent that, uh, you know, we, that the, the community had lost track of what a great place the founders had in mind. Uh, while we were there, we did a lot of drawing. And my wife, Madi, who's manning the webinar over here, um, got out her watercolors and got inspired actually to draw a, um, a painting that had the street grid of downtown uh, in the foreground with its surroundings of groves and then uh, Iron Mountain and the tower in the background. And it really kind of became, and of course the clock tower, it became a symbol of this idea of the city and the garden. So we, we took that on and said, if you could get back on track with the Olmsted Brothers vision, which included extensive street tree planting, for example, how much better could you make it? And we made a series of, of computer images. This is a, a diagram of the existing conditions circa 2018. So now it's an ancient historical document, <laughs> 2019. And then we simulated what would happen if you undertook a, a street tree planting campaign and did strategic surgical infill of new buildings, not slash and burn, slum clearance, scrape off urban renewal, but rather gentle infill uh, in the lost space. We did this in maps too. So the one on the left is the existing conditions. The little gray boxes are buildings and the little green blobs are trees. And on the right is you know, the illustrative plan, a what if picture of after redevelopment. And so in Lake Wales Connected, you can zoom in on those maps and you can actually see what we imagined that might mean for each individual street or the network of trails, for example. So doing the same process for the Northwest neighborhood, existing conditions, and then after street tree, street trees are allowed to grow into place. And then we use these tools to explain uh, the concepts, whether they were best practices or the suggestions of the many people who volunteer time on the, on the plan or advice from the technicians and economics or traffic engineering, um, all the things we couldn't help noticing we labeled those and said, here's where you can see those happening on the plan. So it's, it's a, worth your time to find it online and zoom in on these pages. Uh, we also realized that this would serve as a kind of future generations scorecard or report card they could use to check the effectiveness of all, the, all of their leaders, the elected and appointed officials in the city, for example, uh, during the time since the plan was made. So here it is, this is the report card. Uh, how many of these things uh, are you doing? There were a series of big ideas. The biggest of these is that design should be brought back to the foreground. So we said, redesign Park Avenue. Again, before and after thinking. There was one picture, we showed a lot of pictures and said, said to people, Robert, do you mean like this? No, okay. Do you mean like this? Okay. <laughs> we showed a lot of pictures to people. And one of the, the sets of pictures that seemed to resonate the most, interestingly, was a little group of pictures of Fairhope, Alabama. Now that has a modest uh, but beautiful little downtown. And Fairhope is not so different from Lake Wales in terms of how old it is or how big it is or small it is. Uh, but they have made it their mission to make the core of the city feel less like uh, concrete and asphalt and more green and, uh, and to, and more gardened. And so uh, the, the flowers in Fairhope, now of course people come just to see that, just to see what's in bloom and so on. So this idea was baked into Lake Wales Connected and thankfully the city has since, uh, since then formed a, a horticulture department and hired people and partnered with Buck Tower and started working on implementing that idea. Oh, we could do an hour on street trees. I'm not gonna do that to you. Suffice to say, street trees are very, very important and they more than pay for themselves. They're worth every bit of the trouble. They're essential. And uh, 
and not for just one reason, but for a multitude of reasons, uh, many of them having a big economic return on investment. Equally glib, I will say in summary, architecture is hugely important. <laughs> um, street trees, architecture, that's <laughs> not hard to remember. The existing buildings have under, undergone uh, some unfortunate plastic surgery over the years. That needs to be reversed. I was delighted to see uh, Mr. Gibson has purchased that building uh, and is in the process of peeling off it, uh, the yucco stucco Boca Raton <laughs> layer that was plastered onto it and restoring it to its, uh, to its original glory. And I hope not, not too long from now, we'll be walking by that and seeing a storefront instead of the blank walls, just like illustrated in Lake Wales Connected. Another of the ideas, uh, I think this is very much an Olmsted before and after idea, is uh, to create a proper town square. The Market Plaza is very nice. I mean, we like a lot, think it should undergo uh, refurbishment, uh, but it also isn't of a size or a greenness necessary to support some of those functions you want in your, in your village green or your town square. And so Lake Wales Connected recommends creating one uh, right between Orange and Park Avenue, across from Market Square, coupling that with infill development and redevelopment and restoration of historic buildings so that there's one place right in the center of town, a green place that you can point to and say, that's the heart of our community. That, so Lake Wales Connected recommends doing that. In the Northwest neighborhood, there's a similar emphasis on park space, not just street space, and recommends the creation of a linear park parallel to the railroad track uh, as an, a better edge to the community. And so as you go through the ideas, you'll see some of them have to do with what I call turning the lights back on. Uh, it has to do with, with uh, making it more of a destination, reasons people will want to come there, making sure you're accommodating them. So we went back to Stewart and said, all right, if we did that, if we activated this and we made design uh, front and center, what would it be like? And there's the before and after picture for a reimagined Stewart Avenue. We recommended that the city begin with Park Avenue as they are doing, and then eventually Park, Stewart, First, and some of the other streets can undergo refurbishment. Like Wales Connected, uh, well, the connectedness takes many forms, but part of it is connecting the network of trails and greenways, connecting to your history. We did a before and after for the great uh, Seminole Hotel. Now, one of the inspirations for making this picture was that the building was slated for demolition when we were doing the plan. So if you're wondering what's happening with that, why is that still sitting there? What, why is that still boarded up? Um, well, the reason it's still there and its potential for uh, coming back to life has not been lost is because the plan says, this is one of those historic resources it would be a shame to lose. And again, before and after. Now the, the hotel itself is a relatively small number of the pixels in this electronic image a lot of the pixels in this electronic image are devoted to landscape. So again, if you're going to be the city in the garden, do it like you mean it. Uh, there are a great many uh, suggestions about building housing in and around the core. Uh, and we identified places where housing could be filled in. And in fact, uh, this example is in the Northwest neighborhood of I think five houses have already been created, completed according to the plan, something like that or underway. And there are more on the way. So this is nice to see that that's happening. As in the other examples, we illustrated how surgical, gradual, and uh, respectful infill could take place. So it doesn't mean pushing anybody out or changing anything uh, about the uh, existing population, adding in uh, where there's lost space. And so that theme occurs through all the before and afters. Well, the last part of the book, a big chunk of the book, is devoted to implementation. There's that, that scorecard I mentioned. There's an action plan in the back of the book. And it. Uh, this is because I've ad-libbed a boast during the interview for this project. I said, well, we'll just make a list and it'll say, do these things, colon, one, two, three, four, five. And I was reminded that I had said that. So I said, okay, we'll make the list. And we made a list. <laughs> And it has 62 things on it. <laughs> some are more important than others. Um, and some are, they're arranged into things that need to be done right away, things that should happen uh, in, the, in the midterm and things that will happen, uh, one hopes, in, in our generation, but might take a while longer. 
So implementation is thoroughly underway on Lake Wales Connected, I'm happy to say. That's thanks to a lot of efforts. Some of you in the room, leaders of Lake Wales Heritage, for example, have been banging the drum. Uh, neighbors have been banging the drum. Your, your elected officials have been saying, well, how are we doing on Lake Wales Connected? Your, uh, your city manager has taken that to heart and he put a dashboard on the city's website. It's the Lake Wales Connected dashboard. <laughs> and you can go there and see of all of the items on that 62 item list, which ones are already done, which ones are in progress. And Michael's at 29 items are underway, something like that. Walls count over 30. over 30, okay. And then which ones are in the planning stages. Um, and it's a lot of them. So I'm thrilled with this because like I mentioned, we get to travel around and look at a lot of communities and not all of them take the plan this seriously, but your community is. Um, there's there's no telling how much you can accomplish if you're willing to invest in it and and go to Tallahassee and to Washington and say help us invest in it turn to the private sector to the developers and landowners and say this is what we're doing in the community space what can you do in the private in the private real estate and I think you'll begin to see this play out uh, right away Park Avenue the connector trail that goes along Crystal Park is already under construction uh, the Main Street section of Park Avenue between Scenic Highway and First will be under construction very soon. It's been redesigned very much in keeping with the ideas of the plan. As, uh, as the city's also undertaken uh, grant applications for trails, the Park Avenue uh, connector trail is one of those. That partnership with Bach Tower is, is cemented. The return of art into the public sphere, um, an item that Olmstead Senior and Junior both wrote a lot about the importance of art in public places. Uh, we can now see that implemented of an amazing high quality level uh, in the new murals downtown. Uh, while we're not there yet on Grove Manor, which is the, the uh, aging public housing track that needs to be redeveloped and reimagined as a mixed income community, uh, I think we will get there. And there have been a couple of important pioneer efforts to uh, to do that and feel pretty confident based on the work the city developers and housing authority have done that that will come before long. And over in the planning department, remember planning is a verb, not a noun. Um, the planning director and his staff are working on changing the rules. One of the key recommendations in Lake Wales Connected is that the zoning needs an overhaul especially in the downtown, but in the downtown and the Northwest, both uh, it, there, it, the existing rule book requires things you shouldn't require and make it hard to develop. Um, it also allows things you probably shouldn't allow and that should be corrected. And so a whole rewrite of the standards to promote better urban design, just as called for in the plan is, is uh, virtually complete. I think that will become a big part of the public conversation coming up. And so I love it when I see the action steps one through 62 replaced with a list of done, approved, check, and moving on to the next one. Last, my admonition. As important as I said, and we say in Lake Wales Connected, the streets and the street trees and so on are, let's remember that the fundamental gift is the generosity of public spaces here. And so I hope that you'll think of them the same way uh, that we're thinking of the other components. Now that's a frozen place. It's not Florida. There's a reason I'm showing it to you. <laughs> Do you remember how I showed you that quote from Frederick Olmsted Jr. And he said, uh, this is what we need to do for beauty, not for its own sake, but for its economic impact, its economic potential. Um, it is underappreciated. And I think even in Lake Wales, where you have such beautiful parks and events like the Olmstead celebration are taking place in those spaces. I think we tend to underestimate the power of great public space uh, economically and and on public health. And I'll give you just one example that I would that I've been studying. Uh, Pennypack Park is a beautiful park. Um, there was a study done of how much it was affecting the uh, surrounding real estate. It didn't sound like a really big deal, you know. 
cause your house to be worth a little bit more. But when you add up all the houses, that was $3.36 million a year back in 1974 when we first calculated it. And now it's, you know, $20 million. So that means there's $20 million of, of taxable value that creates the revenue that makes things go in city government that is available because the park is there. Let me use another example. Um, one with the uh, Olmstead uh, firm history, Rock Creek Park. They calculated that $9 million a year in additional property tax goes to the District of Columbia from the adjacent properties. So when we lift out a, an area from development and we say that's one of the green parts and we're starting with the green parts, we're not subtracting from the potential of the, of the economic ecosystem to thrive. We're actually improving the chances that that much and more value will be created all along its edges. Um, now, there are other ways that we get payback on these things. Sacramento recently did an analysis and they found that people were saving $20 million a year on their healthcare bills because the parks, the physical activities in parks were causing or allowing those physical <coughs> culture of physical activity assets were causing so many more people to get the recommended daily exercise. Isn't that amazing? And you can just go through every lens. What about the number of people who come to a place? Well, not many people used to go to Bryant Park. Um, and it, you know, the rents in the, in the surrounding areas were comparable to those at Bryant Park before its refurbishment, before that investment took place. And then uh, after they redid it, the surrounding area became more valuable. But and immediately around Bryant Park, even more valuable and by a lot. So there's a kind of public private partnership between the value of those properties around our great parks and streets and greenways and uh, the investments we make in the parks themselves. So I started with Olmstead and his Central Park. I'll end with that. But uh, I would be wrong if I only talked about the payback on real estate values or ad valorem taxes or something like that from important public spaces. What the doctors are telling us is pretty compelling. If you live within half a mile of a class one bikeway, like the Lake Wales Trailway bike path, you're 15% more likely to get your recommended daily exercise. Now 15% probably just sounds like a little nudge, right? But to public health officials, if they could get 15% more people to get their recommended daily exercise in the context of chronic and, and epidemic uh, situations of childhood obesity and early onset diabetes, and hypertension and heart disease and so on, that's worth billions. And they'd do anything they could come up with to get 15% more of us to get our exercise. Uh, and it turns out that just being among trees will drop your blood sugar more than uh, for half an hour, more than three hours of cycling. Here's one that they found on kids with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, you could give them the dose of the leading drug or you could take them on 20 minute walk in a park and have the same result to their chemistry and concentration. Um, we found that, that uh, stress goes down just like Olmsted suspected was true. He didn't have the modern clinical trials and public health uh, analysis protocols that we have now but they studied his idea and they found out it was true. Um, people with anxiety, um, there's more anxiety where there's less green. So the next time you see Lake Wales Park or Crystal Lake Park um, or one of these generous green inheritances, think that's not just pretty, that's actually making my community, my kids, my grandkids healthier. And so that's the connected joined up thinking behind Lake Wales Connected. Thank you very much. Mr. Company, would you have a little time? Repeat the question, please. Okay. All right. So um, first of all, there are so many Olmstead scholars in the room that I fear I've got, I got some of that wrong. Any corrections? David, Robert? <laughs> um, it, by all means, dispute me. Do you have questions what, or, or suggestions, observations based on what I've brought up? Yes, ma'am. Um, I had a comparison question. A picture of Stewart Avenue mm -hmm. and then with all those people. What time of day 
And what day of the week was that? The 1970s picture back when yeah. it was busy. It looks like afternoon light. The question was, what time of day was the historic picture or what day of the week was the historic picture of downtown taken? And I'm pretty certain it's a weekday uh, and it looks like mid afternoon sun. So if I'm right, then it was probably just people going about their errands toward the end of their workday. Back when you would do things like buy furniture, go to a pharmacy in downtown. Why do you ask? Well, I'm a planner. But I think what's interesting, though, too, is it's um, a lot is different about our society and the way people behave mm. now. A lot is different about our society and the way people behave. A lot. A right. lot. Happy it's motoring. Fun. That's what they told us and we should do more of. Population, which is, that's the most striking thing to me about that. There's a lot less population in the 1970s than there is right. first now. There's a lot more people. Yeah. So it's just, there's a lot of factors. Sure. In that picture, so the, hard to describe. I think you find that when you look at the 1920s pictures as well, you'll see these pictures of folks who dressed up to walk down the street and, and in hot full length woolen clothing and you went in Florida and you say, wow, they must have been a different society than the one that we're in. But that said, I think there are some things that stay the same. For example, um, because we can make a long list of the behaviors that are different now and the way society operates is different now. But there are some things that are constant. For example, we want to attract pedestrians. We're going to attract more of them with uh, transparent ground floor glazing on our storefront windows instead of a blank wall. People tend to walk more when there's shade and when there's something to look at and walk less when it's hot and where there's where the environment is not stimulating. So I found it interesting that in the old pictures, again, from the 1930s or, or the 1970s, uh, how much energy and attention and enthusiasm and artistry was put into sign making. Isn't that interesting? That, I mean, neon carefully curved by a glass blower and all that sort of thing, that, that, that there was this emphasis in human creative expression being on display everywhere in your, in your field of vision. And of course it was in order to sell you something, you know, it wasn't just for art for art's sake, but, but it much more stimulating an environment and then the one that gradually uh, replaced it. So, but I, and I do think that we drive a lot more now and that's one of the things that needs, we need to fix, frankly. Uh, we, the, the plan is not naive. It doesn't think you're going to have a subway system in Lake Wales and, you're going to, um, everyone is going to magically fly around in, in flying cars or any of that stuff. It, it says people are going to drive. And in fact, the whole page after page are devoted to the parking solutions in downtown. But, uh, but it does say that uh, it has to look like people live in this habitat, not just cars. And that it would be better if we could increase the percentage of our trips that are made by walking, biking, and transit while they've decreased over the decades prior. So those are those are uh, uh, kind of ideas about society that are baked in. Well, why? Well, because remember what I said about being suspicious of growth and change. The typical exchange or the feeling that we get about in suburban development is that we have this much economic progress, usually paying some terrible price for it, like watching a grove disappear when they pull it down and put up houses. We get this much economic progress, and we get that much new traffic congestion. It just doesn't seem fair. You might, you might even be willing to take it if it was this much economic development and job creation or what have you for a, a commensurate amount of traffic congestion. But when we get this much benefit, let's call it, or growth accommodated or economic activity, those, those exchanges that are happening, you know, when we open our wallets and cash registers, get this much of that and get that much traffic congestion, no wonder we're angry about growth in Florida. Uh, so Lake Wales isn't messed up, which is one of the reasons why I'm so focused here. So I think this is a place where, because much of the last generation of growth and change skipped over Lake Wales, not all of it, uh, there's still a lot here, a lot of, there's a chance here to do better. Yeah, Sam, you have a question? Yeah. So your Lake Wales perspective plan picks up a lot of reimagining infrastructure and all that. Is there work in it to over 
so the, the question was, the plan envisions all kinds of changes to infrastructure, like making streets better, but does it also propose to create a culture of maintenance so that those things are still good uh, 100 years from now? Uh, I like to think it's it's there and it's baked in. It's certainly in every conversation. It's also why I often end with the, as Charter Olmsted Jr. did, with the economic impact of these good things that they have their way of paying back, because uh, you'll need to concentrate on capturing some of that value for the good for the maintenance. But it's simply this: a community worthy of the name has at least some pride of place, and it puts money back into. Uh, the things it's built so that they stay good and it doesn't let them decline. And there, there was a period of decline without doubt here. And not that there weren't great efforts going on because there were and the historic preservationists, for example, in Lake Wales accomplished a, a, a almost unthinkably difficult task of, to save what was saved here. Uh, when in, in another peer community, half of it would be gone. And so, I think lots of good was done, but in that same period of time as Americans fled to the, to the suburbs and uh, Lake Wales lost some of its original economic reason for being, uh, and the sheer effect of surplus, you know, the downtown was designed several times bigger than the local economy grew to support because the founders thought it would be a bigger, more important city than it turned out to be. Um, so all of those things have kind of kept a lid on uh, the amount of money available to do things. But lately, I think that's really been turned around. For one thing, your city administration, your community redevelopment agency, your Main Street organization, all three are very clever about leveraging small amounts of funds to get bigger amounts of funds to come on top of it. And that will help with building stuff. The culture of maintenance is partly just rekindling that pride of place. The best tool for maintenance is a, uh, a neighbor that won't have it any other way. And, you know, they say we live in a squeaky wheelocracy. Um, a neighbor that calls and says, Michael, that thing is still rusty. And I told you last week it was rusty. You know, Michael's going to get tired of hearing that, getting that phone call, right? And he's going to, if he has to do it himself, he'll go out there with a bucket of paint and he'll get that rust. And so the best tool we have is a population that loves this place as much as you do, that sticks up for it every day, writes letters to the editor, you know, goes to the city commission meetings and says, why is that rusty thing still rusty? And if that, um, if that happens, I know we did something right because we rekindled people's confidence in the place. Robin? There's a book called Street Design. I sleep with under my pillow. <laughs> Big, fat, heavy textbook. Yeah. It's multi-purpose yeah. tool. Two questions. Two questions. One. Please identify the lead author for it. And second, the uh, uh, kind of the interesting thing to me in the book was the fact that it doesn't matter whether you're in Tokyo, Oslo, or Omaha, <coughs> there are things that humans respond positively to and are drawn to. Now, question one, who is the lead author? Question two, what are some of those components and where do they appear in Lake Wales today? Well, first, um, that street design book, a fine textbook, uh, is a result of co-authoring by the great New York architect, John Massingale, and his humble sidekick, me. But uh, <laughs> the humble sidekick is first. <laughs> I would say I would tell you uh, I'm glad you remember the book, Robin. That's really gratifying. The, um, actually, when we when we wrote the first edition of the book, we said, you know, this is a good book. Someday we'll do a second edition, and when we do, we'll switch the names, and it'll be John's name. John, his, his turn to come first. So actually, when we turn in the draft of the second edition of the street design book in uh, in the fall. It'll have John's name first. <laughs> it's his turn. Um, uh, well, okay. So that uh, textbook on street design, the subtitle is actually what it's really about. So it's, the subtitle is The Secret to Great Cities and Towns. And the reason for that, uh, Deputy Mayor, was 
we've come to feel over a long period of time that street design is the the thing you can least afford to get wrong in city in city making uh, the planning stage engineering or um, maintenance it's also the thing that's gotten wrong most often and not just uh, in florida but everywhere but especially here so uh getting better at street design is one of uh, one of the goals in lake wales connected and if there's a deep, there's a straight line between the basic principles for streets where people want to be that are described in the book with uh, you know a couple hundred examples and then the the recommendations for what to do in lake wales connected the first the streets where people want to be have a shape they're like a public room where the walls of that room are the are the buildings or the trees or both. Uh, and the floor is the space like sidewalks and the carriage way where we drive and so on. Um, and sometimes the tree canopy is its ceiling. If you begin to think of those spaces three dimensionally like a room and shape them, then you'll be closer to creating a place where people want to want to be. And urban designers walk around like this. Uh, even if they're University of Miami fans, you know, it's all about the U. They, uh, th what they're looking at is the building height to street width ratio. It's a proportion. So like filmmakers sizing up their next shot, what we're doing is we're looking at a street like Park Avenue, for example, which is about like that. We're looking at the building height on the side versus the street width to see if how wide or narrow it is. There are all kinds of streets, but generally speaking, when they're about as tall as they are wide or even a little taller. They feel more agreeable to us as human beings. And that happens in every climate, every culture, uh, every continent. And when they start to get really wide, like the, you know, the one story Kmart over here and a giant parking lot, a giant road, and then a, another giant parking lot, and then a one story circuit city over there, I deliberately used businesses that didn't make it. Um, then that sense of place dissipates, goes away. So this is the, probably the most important thing because it's the one most affected by zoning. The decisions that a developer and their designers are gonna make on a site plan, the rules that the city is gonna enforce about the setbacks or set forwards on a building are all coming from that. And then the other uh, uh, rules are things like making it comfortable. Um, people like the have the street that keeps them in the shade if they're in a hot sticky climate for example rather than in the full sun so that's partly the street trees partly the architecture uh, they like to be on streets that are connected you know they actually go somewhere as opposed to having to go down and back the way they they came um, that's pretty obvious isn't it streets where people end up seeing their neighbors and saying hi are the streets that lie along their natural paths between their origins and their destinations so that's one of them. We, um, the streets where people want to be are also places where that human creativity is on display that I talked about. So the beauty in the architecture and the signs and the landscape um, on you know, the, what you see in your field of vision matters, not just the number of square feet on a, on a chart or the like. So those are examples and they certainly seem to transcend climate, culture and continent. I have a follow up okay. comment to Shonda's question about the Stewart Avenue picture. Mm -hmm. So last weekend I went to Winter Garden and it was in the afternoon <laughs> and I went there to go bicycling and it was just very vibrant. And, and so even though our behavior has changed, I think <coughs> we can uh, have examples of vibrant cityscapes for the reasons that you just elucidated. Well, let me say, there is nothing that Winter Garden has accomplished, or Winter Haven has accomplished, or Winter Park has accomplished, that you can't accomplish in Lake Wales, even though you don't have winter in the name. Um, <laughs> and, it, and all three of those places have been able to leverage the things that we've been talking about here, the designed things, like they're a result of people drawing lines on a map or saying, let's do it this way, not that way. Uh, their design results, though they leverage that to create uh, that place people want to be, and then all of the other things you want, like cash registers ringing and property appreciating in value, and the tax base growing, so you can you can replace the roof on City Hall when it needs replacing. All those things fall into place from there. And I, I think Winter Garden sets a terrific example because they said we're going to accommodate on the Main Street, for example, we are going to accommodate the automobile 
We're not going to pretend it doesn't exist or drive it away or whatever, but we're not going to allow ourselves to be dominated by it. And uh, Wade Walker, who worked on that project all, all years ago, sitting right back there, can probably elaborate. Is there anything I missed about Winter Garden that you would add to that? Um, Victor, other than the fact that we had taken a picture of Winter Garden 20 years ago, it would have looked very much like the picture we ended up on Do you have that photo? I think I, I smell an op-ed coming. <laughs> The Edgewater Hotel, yeah. a fine place. And a food hall. Well, so if Winter Garden can do it, you can do it. And like Wales, you, there's not a thing they they uh, they have that you lack. I think a negative attitude towards um, development is because uh, now, like developers everywhere, that you get uh, the development is the years of uh, I know. A so, so a negative so attitude is. The comment was that uh, a negative attitude develops about development because it seems like developers now expect to get um, breaks like 10 year tax abatement or something. Um, and what I would say about that is, well, first of all, if it's the default setting and every basic development needs it in order to make their numbers work, we're doing something wrong. Should be the, those tools should be uh, the, for the exceptional cases. A place that's hard to develop and you need to prime the pump would be a good place to use those tools. Um, a place that doesn't need them, I'm just getting it because everybody gets it, is um, highly questionable. In California, they used uh, what they called uh, redevelopment. It's a what we call here in Florida tax increment finance. It's the basic economic tool used by your community redevelopment agency. But it became so overused that tax increment finance was in every deal of every scale and every setting all over this place. And all of the taxing authorities, not just the state or the county, but the hospital authority and the, the water management district and the school districts were not getting the benefit of the progress. And so eventually, one of tax increment finance's greatest practitioners, um, Governor Jerry Brown, um, who, who has the the mayor of Oakland was using it every day, all the time, billions of dollars per case. When he went back to Sacramento and became the governor, he said, we can't keep doing this. And they turned it off. They turned that spigot off. And I think in Florida, we've had several uh, uh, mo moments in the ebb and flow and life of the legislature where they've toyed with doing exactly the same thing. If we abuse the tools, they're going to take the tools away from us. So we should be using them for the right things. That said, um, if you're not using it for everything, when you do use it, it should everybody should notice. You mean, if I do more of that and not this, you're going to help me do it? Maybe it's not even financial. Maybe it's just a faster path to a permit. You mean, if I do this thing you said you wanted and Lake Wales Connected, I can get my permit right away? But if I do this other thing, that's the usual thing I do out by the side of the road in Laughlin, that that you're not gonna help me do that and it's gonna take me longer and I might be told no by the board that reviews these things and it's gonna cost me more. How do I do this thing again? That's that, that's what you need to set up. And so as you continue to tweak the tool book, the toolkit of the rules here in Lake Wales, I think thinking about it from the point of view of an investor or property owner or developer and saying what would make what would induce me to do this right thing the right thing would be the good building the street relationship for example where the buildings in the front not the parking just to name one um that's the thing that should get all the rewards whether it's a faster path to a permit or even partnership of some financial sort i like your question Any, one more Do I think that these new ideas will be applied to uh, these ideas will be the Lake Wales connected ideas? 
will be applied to the new construction along 27? Of course not. <laughs> um, I'm sorry to be disappointing, but the, the, okay, this work is is newer than those long standing plans, long simmering plans for yet another road widening and rework of the intersections along 27. Those have been in the works for a long, long time. So they are not influenced by this. And and I'm 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 waiting to see when it's all done, you know, maybe when they finish all the orange barrels that have, you know, it's been orange barrel season around central and 27 for a few months. Well, not, not so much. Right. So the question is about the, the development then, not about the. Re I thought you meant the reconstruction of the street. Yeah. Well, just to finish, tie off the other point, um, we all, all just ordinary citizens, need to constantly remind the state that they're operating a Department of Transportation and not just a Department of Highway Traffic because we want them to spend their money on the things that will make it better, uh, not worse, that will make it easier to walk and bike and use transit in the future, not just to drive everywhere for everything every time. And if we do that, there's hope for even those corridors. On the other hand, the new development. Um, the good thing about Lake Wales Connected is that as, uh, as thick a book as it is and as many drawings as were done and as much money as was spent and everything, it was it's focused on downtown and the Northwest neighborhood. The bad thing is there's a whole lot more to Lake Wales than just those two areas in the core. And, and they are entering a period of change. Um, so the, I think the, there's a question before the city about how it's gonna use this next wave of prosperity and interest. Because 20 years ago, nobody was trying to develop the lost space behind the Aldi or uh, a, a subdivision in the orange groves was an every once in a while thing in this part of the county. But now it seems like every day there's another application for another few hundred units or another few hundred acres. And I think that means that um, it, will be, it will be time to do for the city as a whole what you've just completed for the downtown. First page of the, the first sentence on the first page of the citywide plan should be, the core is the most important thing. And I really believe that's true unless you can leverage the ability of the existing neighborhoods to absorb the growth and, and prosperity uh, in a graceful way and make money doing it, um, then of course they're gonna say, well, we have to do it on the edge where we can just draw one big line around a property and make a deal with one farmer and then come in and get one zoning permission, and run, run with it. Um, so I think that the first sentence should be downtown the core the areas around the lake and northwest and downtown are the are the heart of the matter and it should be the primary focus of the city the second sentence should say whenever we add on to the to the existing settlement of lake wales it should be in the form of really good neighborhoods connected compact complete mixed use mixed income mixed housing types public space start with the green parts everything i've been describing um, it, to do anything less wouldn't be worthy of the work that came before. That's my opinion. <laughs> All right. So with that, Trisha, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Thank you.